Uh, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Matilda. Thank you, Kristen. My name is Eula Sabal. I'm going to be reading one poem called Yowl uh, that I actually wrote like a year before the pandemic started, but I thought it'd be fun and in the theme of Matilda's book. Yowl. Lonely is just in case condom aging past its stamped date. Lonely as shoulder blade blanks your sunblock can't quite reach. Sound of one hand cracking mint stems for a single double drink. Carbonation floods one tongue as one thumb scrolls dog memes. Lonely as alley cat in heat. Oblong pearl yowls rippling her arched back kinked. Lonely as unused plate your server removes with quick grace. Lonely as first froth. Lonely as 3 a.m. fog porn. Lonely as the pens hover over emergency contact. Lonely as the last 10 seconds of New Year's Eve. New Year's Day afternoon. Lonely. Lonely as the swamp at sunset. As the first I love you, you no longer mean. Waking up from a hot Dream, lonely as straight to voicemail, lonely yeet, messy collapse with the ringly, parched, lonely. On the grass, blue plums split to mush, their spilled pits sprout snow trees. Thank you so much. I can't wait to hear the rest of the show. Take it away, whoever's next. Hi. Um... Alyssa, I'm so excited to see your work uh, live again. And I wanna say thank you to everyone who's come out in support of the freezer door uh, tonight. I'm uh, very excited about uh, Matilda's book. I actually reviewed it for the Washington Post before she knew, she didn't know, and then she'd asked me to do this reading. And then um, I'm just so gl glad to see it live. I spent so much time with her work. Um, just, you know, the anthologies, um, her novels, I read them in like, just, I stayed up late, like many nights in a row just reading and it was so beautiful to be in her mind walking these streets. So my own novel, uh, Subduction, is based in Nia Bay, uh, which is the Macaw Nation uh, out on the northwest tip of the lower 48 uh, here in Washington state and its own sovereign nation. Um, and it unfurls between two protagonists, uh, one named Claudia, who is an anthropologist who has uh, gone out to Nia Bay in the midst of a major crisis in her life. Uh, her husband has just left her for her sister and she's flailing. And rather than taking time to process her grief and find a way to live differently, uh, she plows through the work and drags her damage into this community. Um, and for all of us who are kind of wading through this week of sedition and assault on all of our uh, a senses and the democratic principles of this nation uh, for all of us who have continued working and acting like everything's fine throughout this pandemic. Uh, I think we know what it's like to continue uh, moving forward, even when you're dragging all of this damage, all of this baggage, all of this trauma uh, into our daily lives uh, without recognition. So I want to say thank you, especially for being here at the end of a very hard week uh, for all of us. Um, so Claudia, uh, she shows up at Macaw Territory and she quickly uh, begins to work with a family whose son, Peter, uh, has just come back to take care of his mother, Maggie, who has uh, dementia and has become a hoarder in his long absence. Uh, Peter's father died violently uh, prior to his departure and he blames himself and his mother for much of what happened there. And so um, he's living with his mother, he's trying to help her sort through this horde, uh, but he's also grappling with what it means to be Macaw. He's been in diaspora for decades, um, and, and he's, he fumbles his way toward Claudia. Um, and so this particular scene is, um, he's been having a hard time asking his mother the questions he needs to ask her, which is part of the reason he wants Claudia around. He wants Claudia to help him kind of finagle these secrets from his mother. Um, but his his intentions are, what shall we say, multivalenced. Peter left Tacoma when his contract down at the docks expired, ditching the stained couch he hauled up from the corner where the college kids left to the rain, containing in its crevasses two lighters, a spatula, and a pair of lace panties. He still had the lighters, which worked, a miracle. Debated on the spatula, but kept it because he didn't have one, and fished out the thong with a bag-wrapped hand like it was shit from the dog he never allowed himself to have. 
He didn't set out to be this way. A man who's defining possession, if he had one, if possessions could define any man, was his truck, but it was where he felt at home. That is, it was the only place he breathed easy. He was in charge. Fiddling with the radio, rolling the windows up and down at will, wiping the oil stick with a paper towel just for show at gas stations because he knew there was enough. He was most secure when roaming. When he squeegeed bugs off the windshield, he liked to fight a crust thick enough to meant that he'd been somewhere. When she still had enough confidence in their relationship to chastise him, his mother said it didn't matter how far he went, she was with him, and so was his past. You can leave the reservation, but it will never leave you. No, no, that's not what she said. She only ever referred to Nia Bay as the village. That's what this place was to her, a village, and it scared him how his memory scrambled her words, shading them with his own prejudices, which maybe were not even his own. His truck breathed welcome and comfort as soon as he opened its door, inhaling deep, glad to be out of the house. You could just leave, he thought, leave her behind and take off, but he said it just to satisfy himself, to feel the sick twist in his stomach as he buckled in and reached for a cigarette. Turning on the engine, deciding yet again not to go for good, made him feel like a man. He took care of his responsibilities. The constant cloud cover of Nia Bay dead in the sky but brightens colors below, the sun sneaking the surfaces till they shone, saturated. Christmas lights sagged across the porch of his neighbors down the way, the big colored bulbs casting pastel versions of themselves on the disintegrated siding. A pink plastic castle rose from the lush grass. Next to it, flattening into the uncut lawn was its cardboard package, still bright with the image of a happy white girl hugging the castle. The cardboard edges and plastic crannies were fuzzed with emerald green. Just beyond, a strip of young hemlock separated that product from the next, a luxury here where housing developments were hard to get, where even families with money had to wait their turn, cousins piling up in spare rooms until a new piece of land cleared the council. But there, now that he was cruising closer, there at the edge of this small copse of woods, a tarp hung from ropes tied to the lower branches. One of the ropes had snapped, or was it cut? and hung askew from one corner, revealing the rusted orange truck behind it, a 1977 Ford F-250 with striped side panels in yellow and blue and red. Its engine block held a spray of blackberry brambles, a blue collar bouquet that grew all over the Olympic Peninsula, down into Oregon, up into BC and east of the Cascades, dimming to dust in the high alpine desert stretching leeward from the mountains. His father's truck, right there, of course, because he had moved back to the nation that kept its past close as could be, closer, and why junk a car when you can just push it to the edge of your lot? Wherever he went, there they were, memories of his father, pulling Peter into his past until he was here, but not here, inhabiting the places they had been happy together for time as a place. He was sure of it, and his soul was stretched thin across it, near to breaking, an aching that was his only memory of love. He remembered sitting on the truck's patterned blue upholstery, filling his dad's coffee thermos with beer, careful to tip the bottle so foam wouldn't spill, keeping his arms loose in their sockets so when his dad hit a rut, both bottle and thermos would rise and fall, nice and easy like kelp in a wave. His dad always bragged on him, my main man, the only one I'll let ride with me any day of the week when they got to where they were going unless it was up a logging road to go feather picking and they were alone. When they stepped from the truck, he would palm Peter's head and the feel of those fingers warm on his brown still lingered. Never take outsiders to your sacred spots, his dad told him. If tourists find where the eagles leave their blessings, that'll be the end of them. But maybe Claudia would like to go with him, because he needed a friend, a companion. He thought she would like it, might soften and take his hand when they got to the top of the mountain. But not today. Ice melted in the cooler next to him. He swung off Diot Hill, turning right at the clinic for the flat stretch of road running by Wachat River, and heard his last six-pack swoosh from one side to the other. It sounded like hope, or at least a good time. A cigarette shook in his mouth. He could not catch its tip with his lighter. Now as he cleared the stand of mossy alders. Now as he passed the tsunami evacuation sign marking the turn up the Hocus Peak. Not as he drove by the quarry with its spray painted terraces. Not as he turned left to the tribal headquarters, which he still thought of as the Air Force Base, so it was decommissioned in the 80s. He needed someone to empty his mind into, and the urge of it compelled him forward. He heard it told Claudia, and it didn't matter if she was a jagged shoal or broke down old rock with some seabirds on it. He let the wave take him, heart spread wide, waiting for the laceration of first contact. Thank you. Matilda, take it away. Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming. Um, and thank you, Kristen, for that brilliant reading and that brilliant intro and that brilliant review. Uh, thank you, Alyssa, for that beautiful reading starting us all off. Um, 
So yeah, I'm just going to read from a little bit from the and towards the end of the book. Um, and people, feel free to you know light up the chat, tell us you're here, ask us questions, comment on our outfits, say whatever you want. Uh, we love to know you're here with us. So I'm just going to read, yeah, like I said, just a little bit from towards the end of the book. I haven't driven a car in at least 15 years, but somehow I still wake up from dreams where the brakes don't work. This time I fly diagonally out the window and land softly underneath a lamppost while the car I was driving stopped just before hitting me. But usually I'm about to tumble off a cliff in one of the cars I drove as a teenager, and it's the fear that wakes me. When I first learned how to drive, of course I drove as fast as I could, over 85 on the highway, in a car with a speedometer that only went to 85. A Volvo, safety for the upper middle class teenager. The whole car would shake while I was singing along to magic carpet rides. We're all stereotypes at some point, right? But how did this plant overflow? I must have given it too much water. Wait, there's water pouring down from the light fixture. I stand on a chair to figure this out and I see there's a tiny sprinkler inside the light. I don't remember noticing that before. How do I turn it off? And then I realize I'm dreaming again, wake up into a day that doesn't feel like a day, not anymore, just something already crushed. A car is not a magic carpet, but still. Before I wake up, I'm wondering if the landlord installed that sprinkler to get me to move out. All the discarded stoves and refrigerators in the basement hallway that have been there for months, appliances for the broken heart. It's amazing how hard it is to get someone to make out at a sex club. It literally takes hours. When I say make out, I don't mean it as a euphemism for something else. I mean lips to lips until there's no space between desire and possibility. I wake up and listen to the Violent Femmes. For the first time in years, the first album, of course, I still know all the words, or not all the words, but enough to start a cover band called Nonviolent Femmes. We'll sing Violent Femmes songs at sex clubs until everyone leaves. This is what it means to love art. Yoga Boutique Update, Rorschach Test, Hot Pants, Splatter Paint Jackson Pollock, Recent Murder, or Field of Flowers, $76. But do the Rorschach Test Hot Pants go with a yoga shamrock sweatshirt? Price unknown. That's your second Rorschach Test. How the familiar can be so jarring. How the familiar can be the worst sense of displacement. Sometimes I think desire is the same thing as being haunted. And sometimes I think desire is freedom from pain. And sometimes I think desire is temporary amnesia. There are eight cops across the street to handcuff a woman who's not resisting four police SUVs. Now there are 11 cops. I think she's being arrested for screaming. Gabe isn't calling me back. He told me to keep calling since he doesn't have voicemail. He says he never calls because he's too shy. But then we're on a roll because he was calling me back. How many times do I call until he answers? Desperate times call for desperate acts, but what if these acts only make me feel more 
desperate. There's hope without walls, but there are so many walls. We collapse against our limitations, creating more limitations. Is it better just to collapse? Thank you. <laughs> Now we can bring Kristen back into the picture. Oh, first of all, uh, you know, we'll announce together, we both have some events coming up. So I'm on a book tour, as everyone knows. Um, and my next event is coming up just this coming Monday. I'll be at Harvard Bookstore um, in conversation with Caitlin Greenidge. So if you want to, you don't even have to fly cross country, or maybe you're on the East Coast. Where's everyone joining? It could be anywhere. But um, of course, you don't have to leave your home. It's a virtual event. Uh, next Monday. What do you have coming up, Kristen? Uh, first up, I'm doing a uh, moderation for Seattle Arts and Lectures for Madeline Miller. Uh, she's the author of Circe and the Song of Achilles. Circe is a very interesting book. It's a um, subversive retelling of the Odyssey uh, from the perspective of a spurned daughter who summons her own power and becomes a powerful witch. Um, it's really beautifully written, actually. Um, and then I am Going to be reading with Melissa Phoebos and Corinne Manning uh, for Blue Stockings Bookstore, uh, kind of socialist, uh, feminist, you know, collectively run, fantastic bookstore that I'm excited to uh, read at. And I actually learned that Matilda launched one of her books there when she lived in New York. Um, I am so glad that Matilda lives in Seattle. I, I was lucky enough to be her editor for a collection called Seismic. Uh, she had a beautiful essay um, in that uh, collection that we just, um, uh, I find, Matilda, I need to talk to you about your sentences because I spent a lot of drafts on mine and you can, I, your sentences are so magical. They're like loose limbed and meandering, but they find their truths and they slip toward them and they evade commas. And I'm just wondering about your process of drafting and then revision. I know it's kind of a nerdy question, but um, geek out with me people. Matilda, how do you craft those beautiful sentences? Oh, I love that question. That's a great question. Um, so for me, I always start um, a new book not having any idea what I'm doing. Um, and so I just write and write and write until I feel like I've arrived somewhere. I don't know where exactly, but somewhere. So, um, so in the initial writing of the sentences, I would say, well, let me think a second. Do the, how? Yeah, so basically I just write and write and write. And then I find things that sort of, you know, be, draw my attention. Like I loved that comment you just made. Um, Kristen, you're like, price unknown, it's her soul, right? <laughs> uh, so I, um, but I'm an erotic editor. So I, what I want, so I, the writing initially is all very spontaneous. And in my editing process, I want to maintain the feeling of the spontaneity um, in some ways. So like, for example, with the freezer door, I originally started with um, oh. one document. There was something, <laughs> thanks for holding it up, uh, something like a thousand pages. And as you know, the book right now, you know, it's very compact. It's, it's like 280 pages, but some of the pages are one sentence. So it's like way less than a quarter of the original text. And, and so a lot, interestingly, a lot of the spontaneity is actually in the editing process, which sounds absurd. It's a paradox in a way, but I think the way that the sentences kind of roll into one another. That's in the initial writing, but I pare it down so that the set, they're rolling into each other even more, if that makes sense. So um, are you doing that on the digital document? Or are you doing that on paper or what? Um, I do it on paper. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the initial, the writing is on as digitally, but I do all my editing on paper. I print out each draft. I go to FedEx and I bind it. Um, and then I write it all by hand before I enter it in. Yeah, I can, I can edit short things on the computer. Well, actually, that's not true. Even short documents, uh, like the essay I wrote for Seismic, you know, I printed that out like 10 or 15 times. And each time, even if I change like two or three words, I print it out because I was like, I have to make sure this works. <laughs> so part of that, I think for me, it is that really neurotic attention to the detail. And at the same time, the attention to voice. Because for me, if the voice doesn't work, then nothing works. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I also edit out anything that gets in the way of voice. Um, and actually, that brings me to a question I have 
about your book because, um, and your editing process, because I feel like there's a certain point um, in the book where it becomes clear um, that it's building toward a ceremony, right? And the ceremony, we don't know if it is going to happen or if it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. um, but we, but we know it's kind of building towards that. And I felt myself at, at a certain point, I was like a little worried that this would impose um, a false sense of narrative closure, which I think often, you know, that's what ruins so many books, right? It's like, you know, when it's like, boom, we have to have everything resolved and, you know, and I feel like, but actually I do think it, it doesn't do that. And I feel like um, at the end, there's still this kind of this, this push and pull between, um, between wh whether resolution is even possible at all. And I can tell, at least as my interpretation, that to get it to feel that way, to not impose a kind of false narrative closure, that involved a lot of editing because it feels very, even up to the last line, which I think is a beautiful, like soft and, um, complete uh, and subtle ending that brings it into kind of a conversational sense and not an imposed like, jun, 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 you know? And so, um, so I guess I wanted to hear about your editing process and the way that you were able to resist that narrative closure, even in a book that is um, very narratively driven. Thank you for appreciating that because just making that decision cost me several book deals and uh, a lot of years. I'm not kidding, man. I, I really thought that I was going to um, not have this book published. Uh, I didn't know. Well, thank that you for making that decision. I'll just interrupt for one second because <laughs> for me, that's what makes the book so beautiful. I mean, there are many things, but that's the, in terms of the ending, like you, like I left feeling, I mean, I know a conventional marketing, publishing industry will tell us that we need that false resolution at the end. But when I feel that false resolution, I'm like, throw this away. And it doesn't matter how good the rest of it is. So I just want to thank you for making that choice. And now I'll give it back to you to tell us more about that editing process. Matilda, I, I hope that you'll edit my next book because honestly, um, I had to fight. I had to fight hard. Um, and, you know, next time I'll be like, well, if if she thinks this is the way it should be, you should talk to Matilda. She understands, you know, trajectory. And the thing is, is that that resolution, so uh, Miriam Toes, who's an author that I love, uh, wrote a book called Women Talking, uh, wrote a book called um, All My Puny Sorrows. And in All My Puny Sorrows, uh, she, um, there's this uh, d despairing uh, musician who talks about what it means in a piece of music to bring a piece of art to its resolution. And she said, there's the kinds of endings that deliver you like a babe safely back into the arms of its mother. And even though you've been taken on this wild ride, you know, you are left feeling comforted and assuaged. And yet uh, there's this other kind of ending where um, you are left shivering and naked in the woods, unsure, looking around, wondering what is happening, disoriented, um, having had an experience and yet not knowing necessarily what exactly, not having been told what that experience means. And right now, I feel like a lot of commercial fiction is an inoculation against meaning. Um, they want to prescribe the meaning, they want to uh, control the narrative, and they want to eliminate any ambiguity of the thought process that would require the actual engagement of the reader. And so uh, I chose to go with uh, Jane Hirschfeld's uh, idea. Uh, she's, you know, Zen uh, priest and poet who said that a meaning, uh, the ending should uh, strike like a gong, but its resonance, its reverberations are in the body of the reader. And so if you create closure, I think it cuts off that resonance. And um, to the extent that I have suffered for my art, it has been uh, to hold fast to the belief that that resonance can only be created if there's ambiguity is allowed to play out up until the last moment and mm -hmm. through it. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for <laughs> appreciating that because literally it went from uh, 2016 to 2020 um, on that, me holding fast on that. Um, and you know, uh, I'm really grateful to Red Hen Press, nonprofit indie uh, for uh, supporting my 
decision-making process and not trying to pressure me into creating that neat little uh, twist at the end that so many books seem to hinge on now. Yeah. Um, so when you said that I'm a neurotic editor, I thought you said erotic. And I was like, you know what? You are a neurotic editor. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'm so curious, you know, um, when you are uh, writing these scenes, right, where the desire, desire is the wind in the sails. It is what is billowing through the text. And yet uh, you find, you, you are able to articulate that while also um, providing room for the flickering between uh, desire and sometimes uh, resistance. Um, the idea, there's, there's moments um, in these uh, cruising sections where uh, things get taken too far. Um, it's non-consensual and it's happening, you know, in real time on plein air. Uh, and yet you don't pull back from the, um, the impetus that brought people into that space. Mm -hmm. And given how much uh, pressure is always put on writers from various communities to represent their desire in this squeaky clean way that uh, forecloses the truth and the messiness of humanity, I wondered how you um, saw that as you were continuing to craft those sections and what it's been like for you to take this honest portrait of a subculture that is of great interest to many peoples, right? And yet has not been adequately represented in literature and to do so in a real way. Um, what's that like? And how did, you, how did you deal with that with your press and your community and, and all of that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I wanna first have one comment. An inoculation against meaning is the best description of commercial publishing ever. <laughs> so please use that again and again and again. <laughs> We could maybe send it over to the big, big one. I don't know. There's only one left now. Big four, big five, whatever number of big yeah, publishers there are. One. They, yeah, they should all just have that tagline. Um, but I, uh, yeah, so I feel like in a way, um, the freezer door is about desire and its impossibility. And actually that brings me back to that question about my sentences, because the book is so much about embodiment. I want the text itself to also be struggling toward that embodiment. Mm -hmm. And so when the text breaks, when there is just one sentence on the page, like the first sentence, um, one problem with gentrification is that it always gets worse, right? That's the first sentence of the book and it just leaves you there because that for me is the way of feeling it, right? And so I wanna move toward feeling in the text as well as, I mean, I'm moving toward feeling in uh, what I'm describing, but the text itself, I want also to move there. And so if it can't hold any longer, it has to break. And so in writing about desire, um, for me, there's no point in writing about desire unless we can write about it in all of its complications, um, in all of its messiness, in all of its nuance, in all of its disaster, its trauma, its devastation, um, its longing. Um, and I think, um, I think in a way that itself is a queer way of thinking about desire. I mean, we're told that queer, you know, even in now, like queer is supposed to not be the marketed, but now it's, you know, it's a marketing thing mm -hmm. in itself where it's supposed to have certain boundaries and it's about the types of bodies that you're attracted to, which of course it is on some level or the types of sex you want to have. Um, but for me, it's about not allowing those borders to take place mm -hmm. and always Desire is not just the experience of, um, you know, wanting a particular kind of body or sexuality, which it is, of course, but it's also an experience of living in the world and wanting um, to shift the boundaries so that the gates are open and the walls crumble, right? And so for me, but I, I, for me, I always have to write about what doesn't work as much as what does, because otherwise I'm just preserving a lie, um, you know, a kind of like shiny, happy people version of reality that always like packages the messiness and clamps it down and makes it easier for some sort of marketing demographic of, of you know, like community, the brand, right? So, so I think, I, I guess for me, I'm always, I, I do write what I'm most afraid to write, yeah. And I do that 
one, because it helps me stay alive, mm -hmm. but two, because I feel like it is what's most necessary, you know? And, um, and I actually wonder in terms of, in terms of your book, um, maybe you could talk also about sort of your fears, because I think there's a lot of ways in which um, fear plays out in the book itself, right? So there's um, fear, the a kind of, and also boundaries and borders, right? So you actually, there was an interesting, um, in the reading you, you gave at the beginning, you talked about this uh, vocabulary, the difference between reservation versus village, right? So village is the word that Maggie, who still lives there, that's what she uses, and Peter, who has left, calls it a reservation, which we might say is an outsider way, you know, of looking at it. And so I wondered if you want to talk about, because there's so much in the book about this dynamic between insider and outsider, between fear and comfort, and then also actually about desire, between there's like a way that desire is, is that craving for connection, but there's also the way that desire is instrumentalized and that happens not just desire for uh, sexual connection, but also desire for community or desire for uh, history um, or desire for documentation. Um, and so, yeah, so I wonder if you want to talk about uh, all of those intersections. Well, you know, the thing about, you talk about desire being instrumentalized. I think the thing that is so often weaponized against individuals is our, our, our need to belong our need to feel as though we are connected to something or someone. And we are, from a very young age, are taught to give up almost everything in order to get the simulacrum of that feeling. And so for both Peter and Claudia, you know, Claudia was born in Mexico and um, lives in diaspora all her life, uh, which is something that I grew up in, you know, Latina, and I grew up in a household is intergenerational, uh, run by exiles, you know, who uh, had a consistent and unquieted longing for feeling belonging and for wanting to be connected. And yet what that often meant for them was to see the very things that they were. Um, and so to disconnect from the self in order to belong to a community is uh, really both of the characters, yes. the protagonists of Subduction, are grappling with that long trajectory toward whiteness that is assimilation to this country. Mm -hmm. And that whiteness takes so many different forms, whether it's uh, taking uh, messy, ambiguous sexual desire and putting it into a box and saying that, you know, this is the only kind of sex that is worth having or the only kind of body worth inhabiting. Um, and the way that that desire is weaponized is it's turned into shame, right? And so shame to me is kind of the, it's the internal logic of the settler colonial state come to roost. Uh, and when we are feeling it, it so often drives us away from other people. And yet shame is uh, a very fertile um, possibility, a site of connection. Um, when people can talk about what shames them, that fear, then they begin to kind of unmake that patriarchy of the mind. And that's the thing that is hardest to do because while many people will perform the revolution and their rhetoric, their self-talk remains the same. You know, the story they tell themselves about their body, their face, their lives, when they look in the mirror uh, is as shadowed by the, the constructs that they say that they don't believe in um, as anything that they might read elsewhere. Um, so getting at that self-talk, you know, um, I had to then, uh, you know, access interiority for characters who are and aren't like me. Like Peter, that section, he's macaw, you know, uh, and I'm not. Uh, and just doing that, just seeking to uh, find meaning through the eyes of someone who is unlike you has become uh, antithetical in some ways uh, to what people say is ethical. And yet I think that not seeking connection, not looking for a meaning through the eyes of others is unethical and you know, leads to um, dramatic lack of empathy and compassion, which are part of the reason that our entire national rhetoric has you know, polarized as a way it has. We're pulling away from each other because we're no longer even trying to see through each other's eyes. And to the extent that fiction can do anything, um, it can connect us to that interiority that may or may not belong to us and yet can yield you know, great wisdom. Um, but I, I do not know um, how it is that people who, who read as a form of policing, mm. to me, we, we look to find freedom on the page. And that's one of the things that I loved about 
uh, some of your ideas in the freezer door and the books which preceded it, um, you know, you're saying unmake the patriarchy of gay culture. Stop it. Everyone stop. You know, I don't want here. I remember what, what was one line. You're like, I don't want anyone to win. I want to end winning. And yet so much of the, um, the capacity and strategies of some of our communities uh, have also been to shout each other down, you know, and to not listen. Uh, and so I'm grateful to everyone who is here today uh, listening. We're getting to the point where if any of you all want to ask a question, now's the time. Um, so if you want to ask it through uh, our host, uh, please message her or you can put it in the chat box and uh, let us know um, anything that you might be thinking of. Um, I want to say, Matilda, um, I know this again, this is kind of a process question, but you write a lot um, and you're constantly making, and I see that you use these kind of public conversations that you start via social media uh, to create. I saw you with your uh, latest anthology. I saw you make that in real time. You posted an idea and then all of a sudden people really came alive to it and all of a sudden you were putting together an anthology. So could you talk a little bit about that being that architect of this next anthology and how you go about kind of shaping the ideas that um, guide its uh, inquiry? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, so the, the anthology that uh, that's called Between Certain Death and a Possible Future queer writing on growing up with the AIDS crisis. And that book, it did start with an idea that I've been thinking of for quite a while before. It actually started with my last novel, Sketch to See, when I realized it was a generational story about um, not the generation that's usually talked about in terms of the AIDS crisis, which is the generation that uh, grew up and uh, experienced sexual liberation and then watched all their friends die of a mysterious disease while the government did nothing to intervene. Now that's a completely true story and it's a story that needs to be told more and more. But, um, and then the story we're told now is that there's another generation that has grown up with effective treatment and sees HIV as a manageable condition. Now that story I think is more uh, questionable but that is also a generational narrative. But the idea is that there are these two generations and no one can talk to one another and will never understand one another. And I was like, oh, well, actually, there's a generation between. And that's the generation that I'm a part of that um, Sketch to See is about, that actually I talk a lot about in the freezer door as well. And that's the generational experience of growing up with AIDS, right? So the first time that we thought as queer people about sex or about desire, we thought, oh, we're going to die. And they're inseparable. And um, so it was, you know, growing up with certain death as part of becoming queer. And so I put out the idea for that anthology. I didn't know how people were gonna respond, but it was, it's never been quite that um, smooth in, in this sense where it was like electric. People were like, oh my God, I wanna write for this. I wanna write about this. I wanna do this, I wanna do that. Um, and I think, uh, and then that was, I was like, wow, well now I have to do it. <laughs> and so I've done anthologies, you know, for a long time and in a way, Anthologies for me are a way to kind of connect the skills I have from political organizing and activism and the skills I have as an editor and a writer and fuse them together in a certain way. And I kind of, in a way, it kind of connects to what you were saying. Um, and actually that book is coming out, I can't believe it's coming out this year. It comes out in October, October Oh, really? 4th. Oh, wow. Yes, so nice. that's like very soon now in publishing time. Um, but, um, but I loved what you said about the requirement to disconnect from self in order to belong. And I think that connects to a question I've been having where I feel like we're always told that community is about belonging, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I wonder, and this, I'm, I'm just gonna ask this question first and then I'm gonna see how it connects to your book, which it may or may not, but I know it's gonna connect to your thoughts. But I feel like, no, it does connect, it does. Because the question I have is what should we actually be fighting for um, the possibility not to belong, right? Like, is that actually just as important? Because the idea that everyone should belong is, is a myth. There's no space where everyone belongs. And sometimes there's a good reason for everyone not to belong, right? Or certain people not to belong. Like we wouldn't want like, you know, some raving Trump supporters here tonight at the reading, right? That's not gonna help us. 
It's not going to help anyone, right? So, um, so I guess the question for me, because in the book, I'm going to take it to the book now, where there is, um, so Claudia, you know, who is one of the central characters, the, I would say the central character in a way, um, she's on the macaw, uh, you know, she's studying the macaw, and sometimes um, because of colonialism, because of this long history of, you know, genocide and forced assimilation, um, sometimes she knows more about macaw traditions than some of the people who are currently living um, in their own village, right, in the Abay. And, um, and or so she, the, or she, she thinks she does because yes. they're not talking. Yeah, exactly. And so I think there's that dynamic between knowledge and power, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's that dynamic between um, belonging and not belonging. And there's actually, I feel like, tell me if you think this is right, but I think there's a por porousness to these categories where I think it also helps you. You created the characters in the book. There's no, um, there's no infallible character. They're all incredibly fallible. They all have a lot of flaws and they all make choices that are um, self-affirming and choices that doom or um, punish either themselves or others. Um, and so I sort of wonder about, tell us more about that dynamic of being in and out, in and out of um, knowledge, in and out of community, in and out of belonging, in and out of um, uh, holistic space. Well, the, I think the trouble with, um, so one of the things in the book that I did was that it's written in very close third person. So it alternates between chapters between Peter and Claudia. And so when you're in a Claudia chapter, you cannot see beyond her. There is no real omniscience. Uh, and so that was important to me because the whole book pivots around the architecture of what remains unsaid between the ca characters. And that, uh, because you know, a lot of times, you know, people will write a novel and then they like want to have these big set piece where everyone like discloses everything to each other. And what I have found in life is that people live in permanent states of non-disclosure, just never disclosing the things that mean anything to them, never sharing it, living in isolation, uh, in order to feel protected against being made vulnerable to criticism of whatever it is that they're hiding. And so as a result, they carry the things that they refuse to disclose the closest to them. And often that's their shame, right? So they carry their shame closest. And then everything else that they would like to connect around is like the shame is a moat around the self mm -hmm. and it prevents them from actually using it, even though, of course, a moat is a body of water that can be entered by multiple people, <laughs> right? So like it doesn't need to be this uh, barrier and yet what I have found is that um, especially uh, I spent you know more than a decade uh, researching the book and uh, spent a lot of time out in Nia Bay and have been very lucky over that time uh, to become friends with uh, a lot of folks that I hosted in my house and they, ho they host me at their house and my family and you know the patience required to be um, to be seen and to be heard and to, for other people to relax into being seen and heard around you is beyond what many people are willing to give in modernity. A lot of times people want this kind of like bachelor style, you know, performative confession and they don't even remember what they say to each other anymore. They don't even remember what, you know, they, what was said to them. And so these intimacies are put into the air and then they dissipate and they never become part of the actual texture of the relationship. What it was was kind of a, more of a, a performative emotionality. Um, the deep listening that we need uh, takes time and that listening uh, cannot be shortcut. There is no moving around it. Um, so to the extent that uh, isolation plays into finding a sense of community, you know, as anyone who's ever been through high school knows, you've got to fly that banner alone for a while before people will sidle up to you and say, yeah, yeah, me too you know, or I understand, or, or in any, it may not happen in that environment. You have to become so comfortable with yourself that you're willing to be alone to find your people. And that to me was a very harsh lesson. Uh, and one that I've kept with me all of my life. Uh, and as a reporter, you know, I'm also a uh, best gay reporter and whatnot. Um, I am deeply grateful to being a woman, uh, because I have found that, uh, the listening that is available, uh, to women, um, the community that we create and the 
um, meaning making, which is not controlled by uh, whatever man is listening in the room, is um, has given me great access to the interior workings of other people, um, merely because I'm willing to look someone in the eye and listen. And so to the extent that uh, this talk tonight um, can be helpful to other people, I would say uh, there is no need to fill, uh, despite what I'm doing right now, there's no need to <laughs> fill all silence with chatter, right? There, it's possible if you keep the silence, people will fill it themselves. Um, so to that extent, if anyone would like to uh, share any questions or thoughts in the chat box, uh, please do so. I, I really appreciate your comments, Gemma. Um, I wanna read it out loud because I think it's beautiful. I've been practicing collective presencing where I feel more held and a sense of meaning than I do in my day-to-day -day life. Collective presencing is a really beautiful phrase. Um, and it's something that we need to create even across the ether now because the nation that we wanna live in is not the one we have. And so for that, we have to show back up during and then after the pandemic. Um, and to the extent that these virtual conversations can be part of that, allowing us to feel free to speak and also to listen and be heard, um, I feel like we're serving our future. Yeah, well maybe, should we bring Claire back in to see if there are any questions? And if not, then we'll just maybe let, lead with our final comment. We, we have lots of questions. Oh, okay, uh, bring first on. one is from Syra. This one is for you, Matilda. How did you think about structuring the book and did you use a literary companion inspirations? Oh, interesting. Um, the way I, well, okay, so basically the book is structured by feeling. So I wrote it with no intention. And then I realized after writing a thousand pages, several years, I was like, oh, it's actually about this exploration to kind of um, to figure out how to have an embodied self in a world that refuses to allow that, right? And so it refuses to allow it because of gentrification. It refuses to allow it because of assimilation, because of the hideousness of gay culture, because of the hypocrisy of queer culture, because of the limitations of queer spaces to actualize their potentials. And so, so the book in that sense is structured by that, that quest for, like I say at one point, I feel like my body will never have a home. And even if I feel like it will never have a home, I know that I can't live, I can't go on living if my body doesn't have a home. And so that home is a literal place, Seattle. That home is, you know, but the home is more like being out in the world, <clears throat> excuse me, and feeling like I can exist as my whole self. And so the book is really structured in that way toward, and by feeling, I don't just mean connection, I mean disconnection. I mean devastation, I mean loss, longing, hopelessness, desperation, failure, trauma. I mean, I keep saying some of these things, but like, you know, I say gentrification is the landscape in which the book takes place. And so I'm always pushing against that. Part of that is that white picket fence in people's eyes that everyone calls the Seattle freeze. Um, part of that is, you know, the mandatory masculinity that's required to be desirable in the sexual spaces that I usually inhabit. And part of that is the sort of walls um, of, uh, that, that disguise themselves as valuable, you know, aspects like community or, um, and so in a way the book is structured uh, in this fluid way, right? It is of course called the freezer door, ice freezes, ice melts. Um, there is this question, I don't want to go too long, but there is a question in the book about what happens when you open the freezer door? <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Thank you for that question. Tell us what's next. Uh, this question is from Linz. Uh, you shared, this one is also for Matilda. Uh, you shared something like, if the emotion can't hold, it needs to break. And um, they're wondering if improv and that building and breaking of tension has impacted your writing or editing. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my writing is entirely improvisational at first, and then I edit meticulously in order to preserve that improvisation. Let's actually, I think we could connect it to dance in a lot of ways. Like you go to a contact improvisation um, performance, if it's, if it's, 
if it's just dance, you notice like, oh, let's actually let's take it away from context. It's ballet would be the easiest example, right? You're like, oh, look at those beautiful moves, but it does not go beyond them, right? It's, it becomes athleticism um, or just perfectionism, right? Contact improv, if it really works, every single thing looks like it's totally accidental. You're like, oh, where'd that person go? How did that happen, you know? And, but it's all in, you know, in the, the score itself. And so that's what I want the book. The book is meticulously crafted, but I want it to feel like you just started talking to someone on the street or you just opened something up. And so absolutely improvisation is always um, central to my process. Okay, uh, this question is for both of you, Kristen and Matilda. Uh, you both touch on wanting to evoke embodiment in the reader, whether the gong resonating through the reader or through emotion. How has your experience of embodiment evolved in your work? Um, I, can, I have a pretty succinct answer to this, which is that uh, for the first decade or so of my creative production, I wrote as a reporter in the third person. And I was able to, from a very young age, as in, you know, I forgot my first job in journalism, I was like 22 years old. I had an authority that probably uh, I, sh I should not have. And yet it was bequeathed upon me by the institutional powers uh, that I was working for. And because that, what that required me to do was write in the third person. And that depersonalized perspective was invariably a white male perspective uh, that was also reinforced by uh, the editors on the masthead, whether or not they realized it. And so it was very hard for me to decide to, after so many years spent accrediting my brain so I could rise from this body and be seen from my mind, uh, to actually then bring it back to the body. And yet I knew that my, my women's body uh, taught me everything that I consider to be the true wisdom of my life. And so to bring that into the perspective of my writing, I began uh, to write personal essays and uh, to bring my reporting into those essays so that my positionality was invoked in such a way that I felt uh, made it more honest, uh, made it uh, more valuable and uh, changed the concerns that the actual writing addressed. And so uh, for me coming out of the third person into the first person in nonfiction um, and along that part of what helped me do that was accessing the interiority of these fictional characters uh, and realizing how much I was leaving on the table with myself and that the trade that I had made was to uh, disconnect from the self, as I had mentioned earlier, in order to belong or to be seen as belonging to an authoritative voice. And you know, there is a service for that in journalism. There have been um, some laws changed as a result of the reporting that I've done. I've done a lot of uh, reporting on behalf of you know, uh, the rights of um, missing and murdered indigenous women, you know, uh, government uh, advocates for transparency, peoples of color caught in the criminal justice system, you know, um, any number of marginalized communities that have been squelched over time. Uh, and yet what I realized is that uh, in order for my own wisdom to come to the fore, I needed to, um, to write from the eye. And so I do that more and more. Um, and to the extent that it has allowed me to be seen as a person, um, the fear and vulnerability that I was afraid of was actually the thing that brought me closest to what I needed. So, yeah, I, um, I'll just speak to one aspect since I know we're getting a little close to um, the end of our wonderful time together. Um, but one thing that completely changed my writing is when I developed debilitating chronic health problems, particularly chronic pain, fibromyalgia about 20 years ago, when the way I'd always written before then was that I would write when I had something that I needed to write down or otherwise I felt like I was gonna lose it, right? And then, but I would write, so I'd write like, and then I might not write for weeks or months. Um, and there was no way to do that anymore. I couldn't write like that. And so I had, I started just writing like one or two, five sentences a day. Um, and something happened at the end of that time period, several years, I was like, wait, I have, I mean, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know exactly what I was doing. I was like, you know, cause I thought, oh, I'm an experimental writer. I believe in breaking narrative. And so let me just do what I usually do, but do it in a very compacted way where I just like anything that, you know, like something on NPR or something that just happened to me or a phone conversation, I would just write like one or two sentences. And 
it ended up becoming my second novel, uh, So Many Ways to Sleep Badly. And from that, I realized, oh, this thing that is a limitation. I mean, it is absolutely still a limitation. Like, because I cannot sit at the computer. Like, people talk about sitting at the computer and writing for, like, five hours. Never. No chance in hell. There's no way. Like, I'm lucky if I can do it for, like, a half hour without my body hurting, you know? Or I get really into something, and I'll be there for, like, an hour, and then I'm, like, destroyed, you know? So I have to move in and out, always. And while that was always a challenge, and I totally wish I didn't have that challenge, it has also allowed me to sort of stretch the process. And so, um, and that is an embodied process. It's not an embodied process necessarily about comfort. It's more about pain and negotiating that pain. But it is, it has made me way more aware um, of embodiment in my life, but also in the text itself. All right, can we, uh, can we do one more question? Yeah, please. That sounds one great. is from Sabrina. Uh, we are wondering what is a queer way of thinking about gentrification and being neighbors? <laughs> um, a queer way of thinking about gentrification is to resist um, all of the rules and regulations that are foisted upon us. So to me, the dream of the city is the place where you find everything and everyone that you never imagined. It's not just that you found what you imagined, which is good, but it's that you have that moment on the street that changes you, right? And it's when you interact with someone you don't expect to interact with. It's when you do things you don't expect. It's when something makes you uncomfortable and you go with it because you think, well, I'm uncomfortable, but, right? And there's that but, right? So there's a kind of discomfort where you might be in danger. And then there's the kind of discomfort where you think you're in danger. Gentrification means it's the discomfort where everyone thinks they're always in danger. So there have, there have to be walls at all times. So like if I'm out on the street leaning against a tree in Seattle and people are like, oh my God, whoa, whoa. They'll like do anything they can. Or if I'm like living in the gay neighborhood as I do and there's, you know, bags everywhere who will like stare at me from down the street and as soon as I get close to them they I don't even exist right that's gentrification like resisting the gentrification is when you do the things that you actually desire and let the world in right let the world change us let the world shift us and I think don't give in like here in Seattle that horrible 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 term the Seattle freeze where people rationalize it and they say, oh, it's the Nordic heritage. And like Nordic heritage in Seattle is this like tiny minority at this point. But still people say, oh, the Nordic heritage makes people cold and distant. But that's just gentrification. It didn't exist as a term, you know, a few decades ago. It's creative. It's that white picket fence in everyone's eyes. It's that sense that, you know, you live in a place that looks like a city, but it feels more and more like this, right? You're like, oh, uh, uh. now that's not a city. Like a city is where you find that unexpected connection and you go toward it. And I think that's also a queer way of looking at the world. It's about ending borders, not creating more borders. All right, well, I think we'll leave it there tonight. I have posted the link to antiesbooks.com where you can shop for all of those books and also sign up for our email newsletter. Thank you so much, Matilda and Kristen. That was wonderful. And thank you for raving, Alyssa. And thank you all for coming. I hope you all have an amazing night. Love from aunties in Spokane. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Let's thank blow you. a kiss to each other. Can we blow a kiss? <laughs> This book is brilliant. It really is. Check it out. Ah. Got one too. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone.